Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. Hey, I'm Scott. Welcome back to the show, y'all. Hang on, i got to get my headphones on now so I can hear the things being said. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning into the show today. Again, it's the Scott Horton Show. I'm him. The website is scotthorton.org. Join up the chat room. I guess nobody's talking, but they're all lurking. Hey, everybody. That's uh, scotthorton.org slash chat. It's IRC free node chat room. Hashtag Scott Horton Show. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. All right, next up is the great Gareth Porter. He's an independent historian and journalist. He's the author of The Perils of Dominance about Vietnam, which they all say is a game-changing history of the motivations behind the American role in the Vietnam War. I have the book, but I admit I haven't read it yet. But it's a game-changing game-changer because I've heard that a lot of times. And then uh, this one I just love. Uh, It's Manufactured Crisis. And in there, he debunks every rumor, pretty much, that you ever heard about Iran's nuclear program, painting it as some illicit nuclear weapons program. He just shows why none of it is true at all. And uh, the book, again, is Manufactured Crisis. And then, so, of course, that's the topic of the show today is uh, efforts. Can we, is it safe to still call them efforts uh, on the part of the U.S. government to put this nuclear issue to bed? And uh, they have these negotiations that have been going on for more than a year now. The IAEA has said that the Iranians are within all the parameters of the interim deal. Uh, They were not able to finalize a deal uh, last month, and they've instead extended the deadline to next summer, uh, July, I believe it is. Um, And yet, uh, Gareth, your most recent piece here, why Obama won't reach an agreement with Iran, uh, well... It explains just that, why you think that uh, the game was up. Oh, I should explain to the people you're a very keen observer of the politics in D.C., of of how these things play out, as well as you are of the nuclear program and the Iranian government and the relations between the two, et cetera. But um, so uh, I guess go ahead and break the bad news to us. Your your optimism on this issue, uh, the possibility of a resolution of this issue, uh, has uh, now abated. Is that right? That's right. Uh, And by the way, Happy New Year, uh, Scott. Good to talk to you again. Oh, yeah. Uh, Welcome back to the show. uh, Yeah, this is this article really uh, crystallizes my thinking uh, more than ever uh, in the past several months about the question of whether the Obama administration is, in fact, determined to get an agreement or not. And I've been, you know, I've been going back and forth uh, in in the degree of optimism versus pessimism on this question uh, repeatedly. Um, I I felt more pessimistic when I was in uh, Iran than I was before on my last trip, um, in part because I saw that the Iranians were uh, taking, seemed to be taking a a bit of a harder line on uh, one of the key issues relating to the negotiations. Uh, and then, you know, I, I felt a little bit more positive uh, when the agreement was announced. Um, but but it's always been uh, touch and go, in my view, as to whether these negotiations would, in fact, result in a comprehensive agreement. And uh, what, what really, I think, uh, convinced me in the end, uh, when I wrote this piece, that uh, the, the chances now are, you know, very dim of, of reaching an agreement under the Obama administration, barring a, a very uh, decisive move by Iran to walk away from the talks uh, and to force the hand of the Obama administration, and, and then we just don't know what would happen. What what convinced me of that is the uh, sort of reviewing the. Um, the record of statements that were made not on the record by Obama administration officials, but on the on background to various people in Washington and the news media, as well as 
uh, a couple of uh, uh, f former administration officials uh, who worked on this issue for the Obama administration until 2013, uh, Gary Seymour uh, and uh, Robert Einhorn, all of which seems to me very clearly to add up to a strategy that uh, appears to inform the Obama administration's policy, which is that the Obama administration believes that it can roll over these uh, negotiations um, indefinitely. Uh, they've already succeeded in rolling them over uh, twice, in effect, once in November 2013 and then again in November 2014. Uh, uh, well, actually, you could say you know they've they've done it uh, three times, but you know they, they they got the original JPOA and then they rolled that over once and they rolled it over again uh, in November uh, 2014. So uh, I think now the the administration is uh, accustomed to the idea that as long as they dangle the possibility of an agreement in front of the Iranians. Um, that that they can keep these negotiations going. If the Iranians do not want to really walk away from the talks completely, uh, that they can continue to demand that the Iranians cave in on the enrichment uh, issue as well as give up the, uh, the ambition of uh, basically getting at least most of the... Uh, the uh, sanctions lifted against Iran uh, in the short run. Uh, and so the, the Obama administration believes it can win a diplomatic victory and have, have it both ways, uh, that it can um, c either claim that, that uh, the, the Iranians have caved in uh, in an agreement, or it can say that it has maintained uh, the bargaining leverage and has kept the Iranian nuclear program um, uh, under control, uh, capped and frozen, uh, even though that's not strictly speaking true. It is a, a, a position that uh, certainly politically is quite viable, in my view. So that is, uh, it seems to me, uh, based on the quotations that I cite in my article, the basis for the present policy of the Obama administration on this on this issue. Well, does it matter that they've lost Harry Reid and now the Republicans are the majority in both houses of Congress and Lindsey Graham is swearing to do the bidding of Benjamin Netanyahu and frustrate this deal at his first <laughs> well, in every opportunity? I think that's uh, that that's a serious problem. Um, I don't think it guarantees the uh, the Republicans, uh, the ability to override a veto. And so that's not a decisive problem, as I've suggested in the past. I don't think that's, uh, that's going to be uh, necessarily a critical factor in the politics of this. Uh, I, I do think that the administration is still in a position to prevent the Republicans from passing new legislation if, if in fact, they're willing to go to bat for uh, the argument that uh, you know this is a uh, uh, this is trying to push the United States into a war with Iran. This is what they did last time, and it worked. And I still believe that that's likely to be the case if they try it again this time. If the Republicans try to do it again, right. And then, of course, this is exactly the argument that Obama wants to make to the Republicans and, and on TV for politics' sake, which is, hey, look at me, I'm not giving in to them. I'm I'm biding my time until I can successfully screw them. Otherwise, don't worry. I'm not going to do the deal. So well, right, and and this, I mean, there there is obviously some ambiguity here uh, in everything that not only is said publicly by the uh, Obama administration, but also off the record. I mean, when they make off the record statements to Politico, for example, as I quote in my article, or uh, you know, to to other journalists. Um, you know, they're, they're always keeping in mind what works for them politically in terms of soft, you know, so warding off the, uh, the attacks by the pro Israeli right wing, uh, in this country. Always Obama. Uh, he could just win, but no, he's got to figure out the very best way to lose and then keep losing. Hang on. We'll be right back with more of the great Gareth Porter right after this, y'all. Manufactured Crisis in the, is the book. IPSnews.net is where he usually writes. 
This one is at MiddleEastEye.net. Hey, Al Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out the bumpersticker.com at thebumpersticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink, so you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old-style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold the bumpersticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it, and there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me, too. Let the bumpersticker.com help you get the word out. That's the bumpersticker.com at the bumpersticker.com. Hey, I'm Scott. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. Talking with the great Gareth Porter from Interpress Service. That's ipsnews.net. Uh, this one is at middleeasteye.net. Why Obama won't reach an agreement with Iran. And so uh, I guess let me ask you, Gareth, if you think that Obama's right, that this calculation is correct, that they can, well, I guess in two ways, uh, you could choose either or both or neither or what. But um, uh, are they right that they can keep the Iranians in negotiations through the end of Obama's presidency so he doesn't have to uh, decide one way or the other? Or uh, are they possibly even right? that they can string them along long enough where they really get their way. And the way you phrase it was the enrichment issue a little bit vague. Um, you're saying they believe that they can get their way, that they can get the Iranians to agree to suspend all uranium enrichment? Uh, no, no. I, I want to make it clear that, uh, and, and you're right, that there is ambiguity in the article. I didn't, I didn't go into greater uh, detail to explain a few of the terms that I used. In that case, what I meant was simply that uh, the Obama administration certainly hopes at this point to, to be able to get the Iranians to agree that they would uh, cut a very substantial amount, uh, percentage of the operational centrifuges mm. uh, from roughly 9,400 to maybe 5,000 or something like that, maybe 6,000. And, you know, for, for the Iranians, this is a matter of principle. It's a matter of pride. Uh, they have uh, said, they've told their own people that they will not dismantle their centrifuges, um, their, their, their enrichment capability. Um, and uh, so, so that is a red line. Uh, it has been pronounced a red line by the Supreme Leader of Iran. And so to answer your question, um, no, I don't think the Obama administration can get away with it. I think that this is a fundamental miscalculation. Um, I, I tried to suggest that at least at the end of my article, but I certainly didn't spend much uh, space on it. Sure. Uh, but but I think this is this goes back to a fundamental flaw in the uh, the whole uh, way of thinking of of this administration, and indeed of the U.S. national security state in general, and that is sort of the perspective of the. Uh, uh, dominant power, always assuming that the United States is going to have and, and does have, in fact, the uh, the whip hand in any negotiations with a with a weaker uh, state, and that has been the constant uh, problem in U.S. relations with Iran all along. That is, the the United States has always assumed that it has such a uh, superiority of power over Iran that it doesn't really have to worry about the downside. Uh, the downside risk of its uh, aggressive policies toward But Iran. now, I mean, the Democrats are a little bit smarter than that because of just the completely blatant example right in front of our face here where we have the same team, this president, this negotiator with the same ones 10 years ago trying to deal with the E3, uh, the European 3, on behalf of the United States and the U.N. Security Council, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, look, you guys aren't dealing in good faith with us, we're done dealing with you. And they quit abiding by the additional protocol, and they broke off the talks, and that's how we got to where we are today, where they have so many more centrifuges now than they ever had in the first place back then when Bush could have had a deal back then. Obama knows that, and Kerry knows that, right? Well, you're right. You, you are correct that they understand that it was a mistake uh, that was made in uh, 2005. Uh, yeah, as you, as you suggest, I mean, Kerry's actually said that publicly. So, uh, you know, why, why isn't the administration actually applying that lesson in this case? Well, I mean, I, I do think that it's, uh, it's a matter of incentives, that, you know, the administration uh, sees that it has an opportunity here. It's pressing the opportunity to the maximum. 
Uh, and and it's basically saying, it's not saying uh, openly, obviously, that the, the implication, if you carefully uh, read between the lines of, of what is said and what is not said, uh, it, it seems to me uh, that, that the administration is essentially uh, thinking, it's not saying, but it is thinking that, uh, you know, we are going to just Wait and see if the Iranians are really ready to walk away from the table because we believe that we are in the commanding position in these talks because they are under such, they're assumed to be under such terrific pressure economically from these sanctions. And uh, I, I think that is the, uh, that's, that's the heart of the problem at this point, that the administration, uh, you know, it, it used to be that the United States believed in its military uh, supremacy and its threat to attack Iran or any other country uh, by conventional means as the, uh, the, the final arbiter in the power relationship. And now that has been replaced by the belief that uh, the United States has this tool of economic sanctions that is so effective that it, it, you know, it's in effect uh, the, the replacement for that now lost ability to threaten militarily uh, a, a smaller, uh, more, less powerful country. And I think that's uh, at the heart of this problem in, in terms of, of the uh, confidence, the overconfidence that I believe the Obama administration has in these negotiations. Well, and especially as you explained, they're trying to get the Iranians to accept a situation where not much of the sanctions get relieved anyway. And so... Uh, they're kind of uh, it's not much of a of a bargain that they're driving. It, well, I think you're right. I, I think it is it is correct. <clears throat> excuse me. It's correct to say that it is at least as much the the uh, present ambiguity at best or or refusal of the United States to say we will remove all the sanctions against Iran. Uh, we, we will use all the power of the administration to remove all the sanctions against Iran as part of this deal. They have not said that, uh, and I regard that as a very serious problem uh, for the Iranians. And I think that that is at least as difficult, if not more difficult, for the Iranians to swallow as uh, you know the, the demand for Iran to give up uh, its red line that it will not dismantle um, its existing centrifuge uh, uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, just real quick here at the end, Gareth, if you could, this whole thing, as you, you referenced earlier, the way Obama played this a year ago when they were going to pass some new sanctions, he said in the State of the Union, hey, Congress, back down. I'll veto it. Don't make me veto it. I'm in the middle of negotiations here. Don't screw it up. And they did back down on it. But that it took the threat that this could lead to war. And he said, well, they'll just use that again, and that'll probably keep it at, you know, vetoable numbers uh, rather than above veto-proof numbers in the Senate and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's a pretty dangerous shtick to use, right? Because, of course, the alternative isn't war because they're not making nukes anyway, and that's a false ultimatum to level anyway, uh, and, and all this unconditional surrender and the rest of it. And so the alternative is more crappy Cold War. Um, but if, well, if threatening well, war right, is the only but... thing he can do to get Congress to shut up, that seems like he's painting himself into a pretty bad corner there. And I asked a really long question. Sorry. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and of course, I, I make this point. I have made the point in a number of ways uh, to, to suggest that the alternative should be uh, to that for the, the alternative for the Obama administration should be to tell the truth about the history of the Iranian nuclear program. Right. Not ready or willing to do that. That's the problem. Yep. All right, and that's so what a great report. Is this what you, I think, quite accurately call a very crappy argument, but the only thing that they've got remaining when they re reject <laughs> the alternative of telling the truth. All right, that's Gareth Porter. Thanks so much, Gareth. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, y'all. Uh, the article is Why Obama Won't Reach an Agreement with Iran. It's at Middle East Eye, and you know you can find most of what he writes at ipsnews.net ipsnews.net for Gareth Porter, and the book is Manufactured Crisis. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quotes, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. 
and, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, all Scott here. If you like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren'sCoffee.com. Use promo code Scott and you get free shipping. Darren'sCoffee.com.